Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me in the back? Fantastic. Let me ask you this question. What is, what is your first memory? What is the first thing that you remember? When you travel back in memory lane, some of you might remember something when you were, I don't know, four-year-old or five-year-old. It's like a dream. My earliest memory, I was seven years old. I'm sitting in the front of the class. And a mean teacher walks in and places a book in front of me. And he asked me to read. And when I started reading, I struggled. I stuttered. And he slapped my face. Boom! Are you stupid or something? Read again. Boom! What's wrong with you, boy? Read again. And with tears rolling down my face, I tried for the third time and I still stuttered. And he said, stop, 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 stop. You're worthless. There is no hope out of you. Took the book and gave it to another student. You're worthless. That's all he said. But because he's, he's a teacher, person of a position, power. I took that statement to heart. You see, ladies and gentlemen, in your life, often you will come in a crossroad. You have to make a choice, an easy choice or a hard choice. I had to make a choice. The hard choice is I have this stuttering problem. I can work on it and try to overcome it and hopefully it will work or the easy choice. I'll just keep my mouth shut and nothing will happen. And unfortunately, I chose the easy choice. Don't you ever do the, usually the easy choice is not the right choice. I took my bag and went to the back of the class. And I told my dad to tell the teachers never to ask me to speak or say anything in school. And my entire childhood, I really did feel that I am worthless because the teacher said so. Do you have childhood friends? I never had any. Because every day I come back from school, I lock myself in my room. I couldn't even speak to my brothers and sisters. I lived alone my entire childhood. Why? Because I'm worthless. Last year of high school, I was leaving the school one day and there was a tab on my shoulder. I look back and it's one of the students in my class. He looked at me and he said, Muhammad, uh, I've seen you around the school and, and you're really smart, but I've I don't think I ever heard you talk. And I took a piece of paper and I wrote, I can't speak. He said, yes, you can. Your problem is you're afraid. However, if you want, I can help you. Do you want me to help you? He said, in order for you to overcome any kind of fear, you need to face the ultimate form of that fear. I don't know what he meant. He said, tomorrow morning, go to the principal's office and ask him that you want to read the morning announcement, which is something that we do every day in school. Read the morning announcement in front of the entire school. And I promise you, this is your cure. And ladies and gentlemen, when you are desperate and somebody throws you a lifeline, that's okay. And somebody throws you a lifeline. Or glasses. Or glasses, exactly. <laughs> When somebody offers you a hand to help, because you're desperate, even if the idea is crazy, you'll still do it. So I listened to him. I went to the principal's office. I said, I want to read the morning announcement. He said, you, really? He gave it to me. I stood in front of 400 students. And in my mind, I thought, as soon as I open my mouth, all of my stuttering problem will go away. Because he told me so. 
I started speaking and I stuttered and I still remember to this day vividly, 400 students laughing at me, hysterical laughter. I've never felt so small and ashamed of myself my entire life. The one thing that I avoided my entire life, I voluntarily walked right into it. Why? Because somebody gave me an advice. During recess, I went to the same student and I said, are you happy now? Is that what you wanted? Like you wanted to see me humiliated in front of everybody? Have you satisfied your sick pleasures yet? He said, Muhammad, success isn't gonna happen the first time. And this is a problem, ladies and gentlemen, that we always have. Sometimes we embark on a journey, we chase a dream, and then when we hit the first failure, we give up. Eh, maybe it's not meant to be. Eh, maybe I don't have it in me. Ask anybody who ever made it. You would never find a person who made it from the first shot. You're supposed to fall once and twice and 10 times and 20 times. And every time you fall, you learn something. A mistake that you're not going to repeat the next time. He said, go back and try again. And like an idiot, I went and tried again. <laughs> so the next morning I stood up, I spoke, I stuttered, everybody laughed. The morning after I stood up, I spoke, I stuttered, everybody laughed. But I noticed some of the words that I used to stutter in yesterday, I don't anymore. He was right, this is working. And I fell in love with the stage of a sense. Every chance I get to be on stage, I, did. I joined the theater group and, and I always, always try to do a comedic roles in the plays that I used to play. Because in my mind I thought, well, I think I laugh anyways. <laughs> they might as well laugh with me and not laugh at me. I finished high school in Saudi Arabia. I flew to the United States. I did an engineering degree. Every morning I go to school. Every night I go to open mic nights and a stand up comedy clubs. Sometimes I do great, sometimes I bomb. But during this time, I didn't stutter at all. It was gone. <laughs> However, I graduated, I came back. I worked as a software engineer, and for the first five years of my career, I thought, you know what, I need to really focus on my job. So I stayed away from speaking, because I wanted to prove myself in my work. Speaking, yeah, that's, that's just a hobby. I don't have time for that anymore. And during these five years, I was working in a really big project. And at the end, they wanted me to present this project to the CEO and the board of directors. And in my mind, I thought, <laughs> presenting? That's a walk in the park. I've been on stage several times. This should be easy. I prepared the presentation. I stood in front of the CEO and, this, and I started speaking and I'm stuttering again. Worse than before. To the point that my boss said, uh, you know what, it's okay, I'll take it from here. Why? Because ladies and gentlemen, each one of you here has a talent. God created each one of us here uniquely. There is something that you can do that nobody here can do like you. And this goes for everybody here. However, if you don't practice your talent, if you don't sharpen it, if you don't do it frequently, don't think it's gonna stick around so you can pick it up whenever you want. What you don't practice, you will lose. I lost my talent. I can't speak anymore. I need to get back. And that's when I joined Toastmasters. Because in Toastmasters, I don't know if anybody is like familiar with the Toastmasters Club, you get to speak, yeah, please. You get to speak every week or every other week. So for me, speaking is like a drug, you know? I need my fix. <laughs> so I joined this club and I'm speaking again and, and the stuttering is slowly going away and, and I'm getting my groove back, you know? Things are great again. The president of the club told me, Muhammad, you're a good speaker and you're really funny. I said, mm -hmm, thank you. <laughs> he said, there's this thing called the speech contest. And, he's, and he started to explain it to me. You, so you, you compete on the club and whoever wins compete on a, something called an area, which is like 
few other clubs and if you win, like you go through several stages until you might reach the world championship. I said, well, <laughs> let's not think about that now, but yeah, I can do that. I prepared a speech. I won the club level. When I went to the second level, I lost. I got second place. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm a bit of a sore loser. I sat in the back of the hall with, with my second place trophy, just hating myself. <laughs> when the president of the club came to me, I said, uh, I'm really proud of you, you did great. I said, yeah, who cares? He said, what's wrong? I said, well, I got second place. So? Dude, it's second place, look at this. I mean, look how tiny this thing is. I can't put this on my desk, it's embarrassing. And he said something to me I would never forget. He said, Muhammad, if what you're looking for is a trophy, a piece of glass, I'll go now and I'll buy you one. I'll buy you the biggest one, if that's what you're after. My fellow audience, in life we chase a lot of things. Money, fame, position, promotion, whatever. But it shouldn't be the thing that we chase. These things are just keys. Keys that will open the doors for you to, to influence others and to change the life of others. It shouldn't be the sole purpose that you're living, just so you can get rich or be more famous or, it will come to you, but what are you gonna do with it? A lot of people don't know the answer to that question. He asked me, Muhammad, what, why are you even speaking? I said, well, you know, it's, a, it's fun. He said, if it's just fun, it wouldn't hurt when you lost, which means you need something more. What is it? What is your target? I don't know. What is your target? And he kept repeating that question. Because if you don't have a clear target, it's easy for you to quit halfway through. For example, we heard earlier a target. I want to get paid to travel. When you have it clear, you know where you're headed and you know what you have to do. He kept asking me the question, Muhammad, what is your target? And I didn't have an answer. And then I thought about it for a minute. I said, okay, my goal is one day I want to speak to an audience of 1,000 people. If I get to stand on a stage in front of 1,000 people and speak, for me, that's what success is. He looked at me and smiled and he said, well, if that's really your target, one day, I don't know when, but one day, you will make it all the way to the finals, the world championship, and you will speak in front of thousands. And he gave me a piece of paper and a pen and he said, write your acceptance speech. I said, what acceptance speech? He said, write the speech you're gonna say if you win the world championship. <laughs> you're crazy, the world championship? He said, write it. Because when you write it, you'll believe it. And when you believe it, God will make it happen. You see, my fellow, thank you. My fellow audience, often sometimes we say, I'm gonna try to do this, or I'm gonna try to achieve that. When you say I'm gonna try, it's like you're just giving yourself an excuse, an excuse to give up when things get too difficult, because you're just trying. Instead say, one day I'll get there. I know it deep down, one day I'm gonna have what I have my eyes on. So I took that piece of paper, and I wrote an acceptance speech. That was 2010. And I kept it with me in my wallet. And sometimes when I'm bored or in the bathroom, I might just take it out and look at the mirror and practice. <laughs> I would like to thank <laughs> the whatever. <laughs> and year after year, I kept on entering this contest and I kept on losing, but it didn't matter to me. Why? Because it's not the piece of glass I'm after. Every time you speak to an audience, you touch people's lives. Years from now, people will come to you and might say, uh, you changed me or you moved me, whatever, and that's what fueled me. In 2015, 
I made it all the way to the finals of the Saudi Arabian Toastmaster Clubs. And I was second place. So I lost the game. But I was happy, you know, I did great. The speech was okay. People loved it. The finals were supposed to take place in Las Vegas in the United States. And two weeks before the finals, I received a phone call. And when I answered, it was the guy who won the first place. Yo, Muhammad, how are you doing? This is so-and-so. Do you know who I am? I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> what do you want? And he said, well, I wanted to ask, do you have a visa to the US? I said, yeah, why? Well, you see, uh, my dad is a bit sick. Uh-huh. And since I'm the oldest child, I feel like I should be by his side. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I'm gonna drop out. And since you're second place, you can go. Two weeks. I don't have a speech ready. I'm not ready. I'm gonna go there and have my ass kicked. And I said, can I give you an answer? And he said, in 24 hours. He said, okay. It happened that on the same day was my club meeting. So I'm going to the club meeting and I'm sitting in the back and I'm not even paying attention. I'm thinking about the phone call. And at the end of the meeting, the president of my club, a lady named Fatin, she came to me and she said, Muhammad, you okay? You seem, you know, you seem out of place. So I told her about the phone call and, you know, the first place dropped out and now they want me to go, but I'm not ready. And I'm not gonna go there and embarrass myself. And she said something to me that we heard earlier. She said, Muhammad, in life, some chances will come only once. And if you don't grab it, that chance may not come back again. And ladies and gentlemen, this will happen to you too. You will have some chances that will come in your life only once. And you might think, well, I'm not ready or I don't have it in me. But guess what? Say yes. We can figure it out later, but first say yes. Don't let it slip away because if it slips away, it might not come back again. She kept saying, dude, just say yes. I said, Pat, and I'm not ready. Stop bitching and just say yes. So I said, yes. And for two weeks, I'm practicing and rehearsing and changing the speech over and over again. And then I go to Las Vegas, 100 contestants from all over the world. They broke us into 10 groups, each group of 10, they compete. And from each group, only one makes it into the final. I entered the group with the belief that there is no way I'm gonna win, but I won. And now I made it to the finals. The last step, and ladies and gentlemen, when you, when you get so close to the target, to the piece of glass, sometimes you forget. You forget your true purpose. You forget why you're doing this. Because it's, it's right there. I can smell it. I can, t I can taste it. Sometimes you just focus on the material things. The day of the finals came, they do a draw to determine who's gonna speak first and who's gonna speak last. I was the last speaker, which is good and bad at the same time. It's good because if you do well, people would remember you. Bad is you get to see everybody before you. <laughs> so they took all the finalists in a room behind the stage. We sat on a round table. Everybody's nervous and everybody's wishing everybody, I really, I wish you all good luck. <laughs> and the first speaker takes the stage and while you are in the back, there's a big screen TV where you get to see who's on the stage. So the first speaker takes the stage and oh my God, this guy was phenomenal. Great use of the stage, the tone, the message, the, everything was, 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 was perfect. And I'm looking at him thinking, all right, <laughs> maybe I'll get second place. <laughs> the second guy comes in and he does even better. Okay, <laughs> maybe third place. <laughs> and the one after that and the one after that, everybody did phenomenal to the point that I sat down and said, Muhammad, there's no way in hell you're gonna win this. 
So let's take a step back and remember why you're here. You have a message that you believe in. You have an audience waiting. Give them that message and leave. You're not gonna win, but use, that, use, use this opportunity to just give a message that people could really learn from or use. My turn came. On the back of the stage, before I walked in, there's a lady who would open the curtain. And I asked her, uh, how many people in the audience today? And she said, 4,000 people. I had a dream to speak to 1,000, and now I have four times as much. So when I walked into that stage that day, and the light hits me, and I saw this vast room filled with people, I smiled. Because at that moment, I realized my dream just came true. I win, I don't. It really doesn't matter. I spoke, I gave it all. The audience cheered, I stepped down. I was happy about myself, still believing I'm not gonna win. Now time to announce the results. The speakers were lined up on the first row and everybody was like <laughs> <laughs> Except me. I'm playing, I mean, Candy Crush on my phone. Because <laughs> again, I'm not gonna win, right? Third place, second place, and now the world champion public speaking, and they said my name. But I didn't hear it. Because I was busy, you know. Until the guy behind me punched my back. Dude, go, well, it's you, huh? What? It's you, dude, just go. And I walked into the stage like a crazy person. <laughs> and they gave me that trophy, that giant piece of glass. And they said, would you like to say a few words? And as I was walking to the podium, flashbacks of the little child who couldn't speak. Flashbacks of of the kid who had no friend just because he couldn't open his mouth. And I remembered my acceptance speech, which I wrote and rehearsed. And I stood on that podium and I said, ladies and gentlemen, if you asked anybody who knew me when I was a kid, that one day I'll be here, they would say, no way. And yet, here I am. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, this is a testament and a proof that impossible does not exist. <laughs> Go back to your dreams and goals that you killed because a person told you this cannot be done or this is out of your league. And tell yourself, if this guy can win this, then you probably can do anything you put your mind into. I took that trophy I walked off the stage. As soon as I walked out, there are TV stations and newspapers and rock reporters and everybody just and cameras flashing over and everybody's just asking me questions and, and it took me by storm. Because in a few minutes, I went from a nobody to somebody that the whole world know. And they all kept asking me the same question. Uh, so Mr. Katani, what's next? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> because really, I don't know. I never thought I would make it this far. I had no plan. The interviews are over, they take me to another hall. And when I walk into that hall, there's a line of people, the 4,000 people who just watched me, they all lined up just to take a picture with me or have me sign an autograph. Boy, <laughs> it felt great. <laughs> And I'm signing over, <laughs> you wanna put, <laughs> please take a picture. <laughs> you too, yeah, please. And I got sworn, you know, like with the fame and the attention and the money. And sometimes when that happened, 
you might forget what your, two, what your true purpose is. Because this was too much. I was having the time of my life. An hour goes by while I'm signing autographs and taking pictures. And there was a lady in the line. And when she came to me, I can see she had tears in her eyes. She came in and she held my hand. And she said, son, I don't want a photo. I don't want an autograph. I stood in this line for an hour just to tell you this. What you said up there will make me a better person. I'll be a better person just because of something that you said. I just wanted to come here and say, thank you. And then she vanishes through the crowd. And I know what I'm about to say might seem too hard to believe. But at that moment, the trophy meant nothing. The title meant nothing. All of it meant nothing. Right at that moment, I knew the answer to the question, what's next? What's next for me, ladies and gentlemen, is I want in five or 10 or 20 years from now, I want to be sitting home, watching TV, flipping through the channels. And while I'm flipping through the channels, I see an interview with a successful person, an influential person, a person who made his life and the life around them much better, a person who made an impact. Hopefully this person is one of you. And they would ask that person, so tell us, how did it all begin? What was the start like? And when I hear that person say, well, years and years ago, I listened to a guy, Muhammad something. <laughs> and he changed me. One person. Because if you can change the life of one, that person changed the life of another. And then the life, it's a ripple effect. The whole world will be a better place just because of you. So let me ask you this question. Is this person here tonight? I can't hear you. Is this person here tonight? Let's prove it. I'm going to take a photo with you guys. And whoever you are, once you make it, look me up. Hopefully I'm still alive by then. But look me up and say, I was there. <laughs> My fellow audience, you know what the crazy thing is? In 2018, I went to my small town to visit my parents. And one day I was at a gas station and I'm filling my car with gas. And while I'm filling my car with gas, I see an old man walking on a cane. I looked closer. I recognized the man. This is the teacher who said I was worthless. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> but then I decided, you know what? Why well, hold the grudge? It's been years. Dude, just let it go. Just go there and say hi. So I go to him and I shake his hand and I say, do you remember who we are? And he said, yes, I know who you are and I'm so proud of you. I've seen you on the news and YouTube. And I said, yeah, <laughs> I bet you do. I just want to say, uh, I forgive you. And he said, for what, son? I said, you don't remember when I was in first grade, you smacked my face and you said I was worthless? And he said, uh, sorry, son, I, uh, I don't remember. The very next year, I was speaking in a very big event in Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. 
And after I finished and I stepped off the stage, people sometimes come to me to you know, shake hands and take pictures or whatever. And while I was with the crowd, I see a man walking toward the stage. I looked closer. I recognized the man. The student who told me to stand and speak. I couldn't believe it. The guy who literally saved my life. I went to him and I hugged him so tight and I said, I really want to thank you. I want to thank you for saving my life. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, do you remember in high school you told me to, you know, stand and speak in front of the entire school? And he said, sorry, Muhammad, I, uh, I don't remember. In both cases, they both didn't remember. One destroyed the life of a child and one saved the life of a young boy and they still both don't remember. My fellow audience, the speech that I won the championship with called The Power of Words, and I really truly believe that the thing that we say matter. Sometimes you have a bad day. Sometimes you're not in the right mood, and sometimes you might blurt out something. You're an idiot, you're stupid, and whatever. And you think they're just words, but you don't know. The person who's listening might, might idealize you, Look at you as a, as a role model, and when you say something like that, it crushes them. And you're doing serious damage by words. Also, when you're talking to a colleague or a friend and say, I'm proud of you, you're amazing, thank you. Again, they're just words, but maybe they've been waiting to hear for years. Because my fellow audience, at the end of the day, what's left is just our legacy. We're all going to die one day. We're all gonna leave this earth. Ask yourself, did you leave it a better place just by simply being in it? And if the answer is no, then you're just a, a statistic. You're just a number. When that day comes and you pass away, there will be three types of responses. People might say, oh, thank God he's dead. <laughs> it's about time. Or they might say, huh, okay. Or they might say, what? Oh no. Which response are you gonna get? I'll leave the option. Thank you so much for listening.